lives, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been patient with us, helping us grow and learn from the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. You've been present, sounds so simple, but it's so important just knowing you're there when we need you. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today we thank you, moms, for all of this and so much more. Happy Mother's Day. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Amen. We appreciate your mom. Come on. Yeah. You better. So um, today we actually have a gift for every woman that's here today. Um, you noticed all those gorgeous roses out at the door. So go ahead and you can go up to that table and you can take as many roses as you have children. Okay, so uh, not except for Linda, I'm sorry, but 29 is just too many. <laughs> so um, just, you know, you know what I'm saying. So anyways, um, if you don't have kids, just go up and take one, okay? Every, every lady gets one today. And um, I also wanted to encourage you at the table is a mother's trivia. We did this in youth group on Friday night to see how well your young people know you. And there were questions like, what's her favorite movie? What's her year of birth? What's her favorite restaurant? Who is her best friend growing up? How many of you think your kids could figure that out? If this, um, pick one up on your way out the door, and you can use this at your Mother's Day lunch. You know, it'll make a good, um, a nice little chat and have some different things to talk about. So you can take one of those. So this morning, um, we are really excited about the service today. And, you know, before we start, though, I want to acknowledge that Mother's Day can sometimes be a very difficult day for many people. Um, maybe you've lost your mom this year or recently, or maybe you've lost a child, or maybe you're struggling with infertility. I want you to know that God knows and he understands exactly where you are today. And we pray that today that you will feel God's presence close to you. And although we're celebrating and we're talking and enjoying the blessing of motherhood, we know that God will also meet your needs. And we acknowledge that today, that he is going to be with you as well. And you know, everybody, all of us, had a mom. Anybody here not have a mother? I don't think so. It would be a miracle. It would be a miracle. Even Jesus had a mother. Motherhood requires self-sacrifice, devotion, and commitment. Um, and it's given freely, and it's given lovingly. An example of this is a story, a little story about a boy who went to school, and his teacher was teaching on math and teaching about fractions. And so the little boy is sitting there, and the teacher says, suppose your mother baked a pie, and there were seven of you in the house, your parents and five children. What part of the pie would you get? And the little boy said, oh, that's easy, a sixth. I would get one sixth. And the teacher said, no, 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 you don't understand. There's seven of you, and each of you gets a piece. What part of the pie would you get? And the boy said, a sixth. And the teacher said, I don't think you understand math very well. And he says, oh, yes, teacher, I do. He says, but see, you don't know my mother. Mother would say she didn't want any of the pie so that I could have an extra piece. Every mom in this house understands that. We totally understand that. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says, but the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against such things there is no law. 
As awesome and powerful as a mother's love is, it is still not enough for raising spiritually healthy and godly children. That's the truth. It's not enough. The challenges that we face today require something so much more. But thank God he has given us the power and the answer to our need. See, this chapter, Galatians chapter 5, talks about the acts of the flesh, living life in the flesh, versus the fruit of the Spirit. Living and walking in the Spirit of God every day in our life releases supernatural power to be the parents that we need to be. Just like a tree that grows and produces fruit, so does our lives as parents. The, this fruit is evident when we stay connected to Christ. And you know, he helps us produce love. He helps us produce joy, peace, Patience, if you find yourself lacking that, you need to connect to the vine. Today, I asked four different women to pick one of these nine fruits of the Spirit. And I asked them to pick them, the one that has most impacted their parenting through the years. Now, each of these ladies has a different story. They come from a different background, and each of them, even a different culture. But they have one thing in common and that's a relationship with Jesus. See, and that vibrant relationship with Christ has carried them through some of the most difficult seasons of parenting in their life. So you are gonna be blessed today. Now, some of these folks, they are old pros at this, and others are brand new. So let's give them a lot of grace today as we listen and we receive what the Holy Spirit has to say through their words today. So I'm going to ask Abby if she'll go first. Can you give her a warm welcome? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Abby. I've been married to Neil for 24 years. It's 25 in September. Um, I have two sons, Isaac, who is 17, and Owen, who is 13. Isaac was born in Bath in England, and we moved overseas very shortly after he was born. So his brother Owen was born in Germany. It's probably why I sat next to the luggage here. This, it's kind of natural for me. Um, <laughs> for the last 17 years, I've been raising my children overseas, which, of course, God knew that he would ask me to do long before I knew. And over the years, he's been really graciously working in my life in one area in particular that really needed developing, and that was patience. Um, I used to be a very impatient person. As a young adult, I was very impatient. Um, so I want to talk about the fruit of patience. I can sit here today and say I'm definitely more patient than I was yesterday, mm -hmm. but I'm not there yet. Amen? <laughs> So around 20 years ago, I actually invited the Holy Spirit to start a working me. I knew that I couldn't stay as I was, and I think without the help of the Holy Spirit in my life, I wouldn't be the parent that I am. And I know this morning that many of you are raising your children, like me, you've raised them in a different country, uh, to the country that you were born in and you were raised in, or a different state to the one that you grew up in. Or just generational differences. You know, when I grew up, there was not even the internet. Can you imagine? <laughs> and parenting kids online, well, that's a whole other teaching mm -hmm. session, but it's challenging. But I can say that the fruit of patience has given me the emotional stability that I needed to raise my boys in unfamiliar places, places that I didn't know uh, I didn't know the rules and expectations, how things work, why people do what they do. And I basically learned from the ground up how these things work, and I've built the house as I've been going along. Unfamiliar unfamiliarity can create stress, anxiety, and fear, and we can't teach our kids what we ourselves don't know. But the Holy Spirit has allowed me to stay calm and learn what I needed to learn and through this process, I've experienced his deep peace as I've parented through some wonderful and, as you can imagine, challenging times. I just want to give you an example. One day I was in the house and um, I, was, I think I was baking. Neil was coming home from work and uh, 
It was very quiet in the house, even though the children were in there. And if you're sat here as a mum, you know exactly what I'm thinking. You know, when it's quiet, we worry, don't we? <laughs> and I called out for Owen. He was two at the time. I called out, and there was no answer. So I went up to Isaac's room. I said, have you seen your brother? And he said, no, not recently. So I stood really still, listening. And then suddenly I heard this howling, <laughs> crying, banging. And what had happened is that Owen had got himself into the attic and locked himself in. OK. And there were stairs to this attic. Um, but um, <laughs> he'd got himself stuck in there, and he couldn't get out. And he was two years old, and it was very stressful. Um, and um, I, I looked through the keyhole. I could see the key was in the door. So I thought, well, OK, what can I do? I could push it through, but would he know what to do? I could ask him to turn it, but would he understand me? You know, I was trying to figure it all out all by myself. Um, I then called my neighbor next door, Tommy and Melissa. They were great neighbors. And uh, Tommy came. He was, um, we were living in Switzerland at the time. And um, that was important, I'll tell you in a minute. But um, he was really kind. He came and he took one look at the door and he said, there's no way we can get that off. It's, the, the wood is just too thick. And the design of the door is going to be too difficult. But he said, around here, what we do is <laughs> if our children get stuck in the attic, we ring the fire service and they come and get the children out. And I was like, yay, that's fantastic. That's great news. You know, everything's going to be fine. And he said, but you have to ring them up and you have to explain to them what the problem is. There was my first problem because my language skills probably didn't cover this kind of situation. And also, they charge a lot of money. <laughs> so, and I thought, well, okay, we need, we, need a, we need a better solution. So, I prayed. I probably should have done this in the beginning. I prayed and I asked for the Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me to what to do. My neighbor was probably looking at me thinking, what is she doing? But, you know, that's what we need to do first. And uh, the Holy Spirit gave me three words, over and over. I was like, Lord, what does that mean? <laughs> over and over. So I, I got down um, and, I, and I whispered through the door, Owen, take the key and push it under the door. And I said it over and over. <laughs> take the key and push it under the door. And eventually, after about 18 times because uh, he was two, uh, he, he understood, and I saw this little key come under the door, and we were able to unlock him and get him out, and phew, what a relief, but, you know, everyday life is full of frustrations that can really test our patience, uh, just driving, uh, but anyway, maybe our children don't do what we ask them to do, imagine that, children that don't do what we want them to do, hard to believe, or they come home late, and you're waiting up for them, uh, they come home later than agreed. They can break things that are important to us. That's happened to me a lot over the years. Things that I've loved have got broken. Or they come home with a bad attitude. Or they don't do their homework. Or they do their homework and they don't send it in. Never understood that one. But anyway. Um, or they lose something like a car key. <sighs> Isaac. Uh, <laughs> sorry. They, or the, or the, the, one, the one that really frustrates me is when you're, you, you know, you're making dinner and you call your children and they don't come. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? They're on their computer game and it's really important and they can't leave at that moment. Ooh, it's like whack-a-mole trying to knock all these problems down and stay calm without losing your head and it's really hard. But I can honestly say the Holy Spirit has really helped me to stay calm and not get caught up so much in these day-to-day -day irritating things that happen. And he's allowed me to stay focused on the bigger picture of raising the children over the long term to become independent and to become more dependent on Jesus for themselves. That's what we want as Christian parents. And, and while we're doing this, we're modeling to them the patience of God. If you think about how patient God is, with you and with me, the times we mess up, yet he's still waiting for us to come back to him. Love, the Bible says, is patient. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. It is calm. It's forgiving. It's gentle. It's quiet. And it's tolerant. And it, keep it, it keeps its cool in a crisis. And it's nice to be around. Is that you this morning? I would encourage you, if your kids frustrate you easily and you know that you're struggling to keep calm 
Bring those frustrations to God. Pray about it. Don't be that mom who's always complaining and always nagging and always losing her cool. It's never too late to start. And I would say with all certainty that the Holy Spirit will work in your life and will make you more effective as a, as a parent. Invite the Holy Spirit to begin the work today. And I'll just finish with this verse. Proverbs 14, 29 says, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you for sharing. Hello. Um, I'm Lori. And my husband is Selwyn. And uh, we are the parents of a 25-year-old who has also given us our first grandbaby, Sawyer, and a 23-year-old son. Um, the fruit of the Spirit that I'm going to share with you about is peace. And uh, God gave me a word um, that gave me peace on our daughter's very first birthday, okay? So I'm a new mom, and Selwyn and Courtney and I were in the kitchen and she was playing on a toy right at our feet. And she ends up falling on it in a certain way. And she cuts her eye right here. And you know a head wound is blood is going everywhere. So I'm panicking. I'm, this, I'm the dramatic mom. That's, I was always the dramatic mom. I had to pray over that a lot, being a mom. And, um, and so I, I panicked. Someone kept his cool, of course. He sweeps her up. We go to the ER and they have to put her in like a papoose to restrict her and deaden it and then put stitches in. Well, I'm losing it even more so now. I'm like, she's crying. She's, she's, she doesn't know what's going on. She's one years old. It's her very first birthday. And I'm sitting in the waiting room going, well, this is starting out great, you know, as a first mom. I'm like... I felt like I took the onus on as the parent, as her mom, like the guilt came on to me thinking, you know, well, she's not starting out well. I failed her. She was right at my feet and I failed her, you know, and uh, she got hurt on her very first birthday. So um, right then at that time, um, the Lord gave me a word that I have carried with me to this day. He says, I have her, whether she's physically with you or not. I have her whether she's physically with you or not. And all of a sudden, this peace came over me. And uh, little did I know that I was going to hang on to that word because two years later, I would have my Michael, who is autistic. And um, some couple of things that have happened to us over the years with Courtney and Michael that have helped me to remember that word and not fret. I mean, I, I panic a little bit and then I default to the word of God and it slowly happens. It happens easier as you go in your walk with the Lord, as some of you know. You remember quicker. So the word that God gives you. So um, Courtney, after she got married, moved off to southern Georgia and we're up here and things started falling apart and I couldn't physically be there to give my daughter a hug to help her through the problems. And then um, there was another time that when she, we were, we were there, but we were at the house and she and Mac wanted to have the baby at the hospital by themselves. They wanted us there, but they didn't want us at the hospital. So I behaved myself and I didn't say anything and I, I did good. But then in the middle of her delivery, she has Sawyer, and we start to lose her. And we're getting text messages, messages from Mac, little ones. They say she's, she's not doing good. She's, she's shaking. She's throwing up. She's the, they say we're going to lose her. And I'm like, what is happening? You know, so it's literally the peace of God coming over you, showing you that and reminding you of those nuggets that he gives us along the way of life's journey. She was fine. She came through fine, but praise God. Um, and we did too. So sending Michael to school when he turned three, um, a week before he was three, he got diagnosed by Children's Hospital with autism. And um, at that moment, we had the option to send him to preschool 
and them start services with him. Well, from the age three till about six, Michael was, he did not speak. He did not say hardly any words. He could not tell me if anyone hurt him. I could not explain to him, you know, things and him understand those. So I sent him to school every day, praying over him and trusting God that he would take care of Michael. And as far as I know, nothing ever happened. So, and I, but I leaned on that word, I have him. He got away from us two different times when we were youth pastors in Quincy at Glad Tidings. There's a very busy street right in front of the old church there. And um, it's Washington Street is one of the busiest in Quincy. Michael got away from us twice and with his hands over his ears went across that street un unharmed. I just was praising God for that. And last but not least, but just one of the many things, is um, this two years ago. When Michael was 17, he started getting seizures. And two years ago, we were in our apartment before we got our house just recently. And um, Selwyn and I would watch the cameras all the time and watch Michael still having seizures, trying to figure out the medication. And uh, we had just looked on him. And he was fine in the kitchen. And then 10 minutes later, we walk through the door, and there's blood in the kitchen, and he's on his bed. And every time Michael would have a seizure, he would say, he would say to me or Selwyn or whoever's with him, you saved me. You saved me. Well, this particular time, we find him on his bed and not in the kitchen, and we're trying to piece it together what happened, you know, and where was he, and how did he get to his bed? And he tells us, Jesus saved me. And what that told me in Selwyn was that Jesus was right there when it happened. And he had him. And he took care of him when we couldn't be there. Trusting God is not an easy thing. But trusting him will grant you the peace. And I can't say that enough to people. And I'm learning it more and more every day. Trusting God will grant you the peace that you can only get from him, and that is true peace. And that has led me through my life with my children from the moment that I first became a mother and every day since. Cling to him, and he will not fail you. Hi, my name is Janice. I am the foster mom. I'm a single foster mom. Um, and I just want to start off first by sharing something that I've, that's been in my heart for some time. Um, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the book of Ruth. Um, and Naomi uh, was married, had two, two sons who were married, and they both passed. But Naomi's story as a mother didn't end because she no longer had children of her own. Naomi took under her wing a stubborn young woman who was reluctant to leave her side. She must have had an amazing impact on Ruth because Ruth followed Naomi back to her land. Naomi then became faithfully committed to watching over Ruth, guiding her, instructing her, she counseled her, which led to an amazing outcome and a blessing that Naomi was able to be a part of. I chose the word faithfulness. On Thursday, I was putting Louis to bed. He's my foster child. And he felt warm. And I took his temperature, and it was at 102.5. Out of nowhere... And I thought, if he wakes up with a fever, I can't take him to daycare. And there goes my day. When I checked him, his temperature in the morning, it was at 100.7. I was devastated, and I thought, God, I can't seem to catch a break. See, I had planned to take Friday off to run some errands since my boss was going to be out of the office. And I wanted some me time. So I texted somebody, and I said, hey, can you babysit? I just need some time, you know, two, three hours tops. They said, yes, I just have to do something first. And then they would, you know, be there. 
About two to three hours later, they texted back and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do this. And I cried. I was, just wanted some time for me. And so after a nap, I took my little one. I dressed him up. He had no fever. And Lewis and I spent the entire day running errands, diarrhea and all. It was hard to remain faithful to this mother role. For someone like me who's been so independent, it's been hard. I mean, I had a six-day-old child dropped on me the first time I foster. Even Pastor Chris sat down with me to see how I was doing after this life-altering moment. It was like being in the dark and then, boom, someone turns on the lights and it's like you're blinded. Being a full-time mom wasn't something I could walk away from now. It takes faith and strength in God to be able to do that. To keep us committed and true to that responsibility that God has given us to all parents. I don't know what your situation is at this moment. But trust that God is with you. If you are having a difficult time, be faithful. And God will be faithful to you. He will strengthen you and give you the tools that you need. As a single mom, or whether you're married or divorced, or you're sharing custody, or I didn't say this before, if you're going through surrogate or you're trying IVF, whatever your story is, be faithful faithful and committed and like Naomi you will see the blessing of your work that you put into this and into raising your children and even if you think you can't do it or you're bitter or angry like Naomi must have been after the losses that she endured I cried when I knew having children of my own was dead I had cysts I had five boys endometriosis, and I had ovarian cancer. But my story didn't end there. You know, many women today, especially in today's world, have trouble being faithful in raising and having a positive impact on children today. Uh, I recently read a story of the many in the past few months of a police officer who found a three-year-old boy wrapped in a blanket sleeping outside on the sidewalk outside of a nightclub. His 25-year-old mother was in that club dancing. She had left two other slightly older children at home by themselves while she partied like a rock star. She was arrested, and the children don't have a mom. It is the gift of faithfulness that keeps us committed, whether it's in ministry, relationships, careers, and being parents. Mentally, emotionally, it has taken a toll on me being a foster parent. Not just because of the child, but it affects my work, health, and it has affected other relationships. I have even told God in a couple of occasions, I can't do this. I don't think I have what it takes to be that mom I thought I could be. Because honestly, growing up, I thought I was going to be a great soccer mom type of woman. But I am here today with my second foster child. Some of you have seen him running around, little Lewis. And I am faithfully committed to having him until God says, okay, it's time to move on. Or he says, you're done. Hello. Um, my name is, is Isabella. I'm uh, Leo's wife. And we have two daughters. Um, Sophie is 11 and Manu is 6 now. And today I will talk about uh, meekness. 
Meekness is a quality of one who is mild, faithful, and who has moderation in actions. Being meek is the opposite of being aggressive and rude. Some people mistakenly identify meekness with a type of weakness, but its meaning expresses the exact opposite. Meekness is a quality that helps someone to control force and apply it correctly. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, why is meekness so hard to have? Meekness is submission to God. Is It is rejecting violence. The meek person controls his emotions and acts with love. The meek person lives under the authority of Jesus and lets the spirit of Jesus control their behavior. It's a fruit. It's a fruit of the spirit. It doesn't come from ourselves but it is flows from a relationship with Christ. I'm not a perfect person, but I try to be like Jesus. Every day I pray to be more patient, think before acting, and act with love and kindness. When my girls do something to anger me, I try to understand what is behind the behavior. I try to understand their needs. I try to teach about self-control and patience. We need to be sweet and act with love. When they scream, oh my gosh, <laughs> I try to teach them about communicating with respect. And I try to, to not scream either, because sometimes it's hard. And um, it, it, uh, this is part of my daily learning. And I want to teach them to be brave and kind in all situations. If he, you are scared, then let's find out together what are you afraid of. When they have problems at school, for example, I tell them to treat them nicely and with respect because that's what Jesus will do. There are many times I saw I couldn't be a person who would model meekness like Jesus. Until a day, a friend saw these qualities in me and she wanted to be the same way. She asked me for help. She asked me for help to be kind to her husband, to her children, her family. And from that day on, I decide that I want to be that meek person she was seeing. I realized that this quality was being generated in me by Jesus and the fruit of the Spirit. Developing the fruit of God's Spirit is a daily exercise. Starting within our home, with our children and husbands. The key is being submissive to God and decided to be more like Jesus every day, every day in our actions. If I can do it, 
So can you. I hope these words find a place in your heart this morning. Thank you. Amen. 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 I mean, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. And um, didn't they do amazing? I just feel the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it's amazing when people share their story, you know? And I know that we've connected today with what they've shared. Something that someone has shared has definitely connected with each one of us. And let's stand together. Uh, before we close out our service, I'd like all the ladies in the house to come forward. And I ask these awesome women and myself, we're going to come down. We'd like to pray for you. We'd just like to go along the rows and just pray a blessing over your life. Um, pray that the Holy Spirit would be full in you and would come with grace and with power to help you to live your life. Um, when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, he makes all the difference in the world. And whether you have children or you don't have children, and every man in the house, we all need the fruit of the Spirit. We all need that to live in our life today. But today is for the women. So ladies, come on down. Don't be shy. Come right up front. The worship team is going to play. We're just going to worship at the front for a few moments. I want you to close your eyes. Just lock in with God and say, God, I need more of you. Holy Spirit, I need more of you today. Come into my life fresh and new. Renew something in me. The young people, too, if you're a lady, come on up. Let us pray for you today.